Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, let's face it, this is one of those scripture passages with which we have great difficulty because it's just contrary to most any and every image we have of Jesus. I know for myself, growing up white American Protestant, the working image I had of Jesus as a child was a painting by Warner Salmon. It depicts Jesus with flowing blonde hair and very saccharine blue eyes. It's said that Salmon's Jesus was reproduced 500 million times, according to one estimate. You know, it's where Jesus is just kind of staring into space. And one has said about it, it's a safe, passive image of Christ. And that's probably why Christians have plastered this image in many a child's Sunday school room, because it's gentle Jesus, meek and mild. And no wonder then, it is so hard for us to understand why Jesus would be arrested, tried, scourged, and crucified, or why Jesus would turn into a rage, turning over ta tables, throwing a whip. It's not at all what we imagine Jesus to be. Dan Clendenden has noted, as an observant Jew, Jesus joined the throngs of pilgrims who trekked to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover at the temple. According to the Jewish historian Josephus, construction on the temple began about 20 BC under Herod the Great and was completed under Herod Agrippa around AD 63. It was a bustling nexus of commercial activity, crowds of worshipers, national aspirations, political identity, historical memory, architectural splendor, and religious affiliation. The temple constituted the very essence of Jewish faith in both a literal and a symbolic way. When Jesus would have entered the temple, he would have encountered people selling cattle, sheep, and doves to the pilgrims, those who needed them to be able to make their obligatory sacrifices. They lived too far to bring their own animals. They needed to exchange their Roman currency into Jewish money in order to pay the temple tax in the coinage of the sanctuary shekel. And thus we read Jesus met the money changers. And that was when we could say all hell broke loose. Incensed at the sacrilege of it all, Jesus improvised a whip, thrashed animals from the temple, scattered the coffers of the money changers, and overturned their temples. How dare you turn my father's house into a market? Later, his disciples remember Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. It's really not clear whether Jesus objected to any and all commercial activity in the temple out of principle, even honest transactions that were necessary for pilgrims to fulfill what was accepted religious obligation, or whether it was fraud, the fraud and exploitation, the avarice of religious authorities who controlled this mean, these means of ritual purity and by their understanding controlled access to Yahweh. No wonder the disciples tossed and turned a long sleepless night that evening. It must have been terribly disturbing to witness Jesus really seemingly unhinged, throwing furniture, screaming at the top of his lungs and flinging money in the air. Perhaps they ran for cover in the crowd as that was going on, but most of all, how do we explain the anger of Jesus? Anger is not an absent topic in the Bible. God gets angry, and we're told at times to get angry. God's anger is righteous indignation. 
about people turning their backs on God, denying God, ignoring God. God's anger is that of the zeal of the prophets who spoke angly, angrily and directly at those who took advantage of the widows and the orphans who robbed the poor and hoarded gold for their own coffers. When we look at what Jesus was so angry about in this scene, we realize it wasn't about him. He wasn't angry for selfish reasons. He wasn't mad at getting cheated out of money. He was mad that others were, but not him. But above all, his anger was about God in that great human sin of using God for our own purposes. The wrath of Jesus, like this, the prophets before him, was about injustice. It was about evil destroying the innocent. God's anger is not about being a victim, and it's not about simply being right. God's anger, the anger of Jesus, is about our failure to be in right relationship with God. Because we have to realize anger is really a God-given emotion. As God has given us love, as God's given us compassion. The American Psychological Association tells us anger is completely normal and usually a healthy human emotion. The Mayo Clinic reminds us that anger itself is not bad. Expressed appropriately, anger can be healthy. It can protect us from dangerous situations, energize us to resolve problems or lead to reforms. But anger can be a problem, a very real problem. The Apostle Paul says, be angry, but do not sin. The problem with anger is when we let it get out of control or when we bury it far deep inside. We know the cost of anger when it becomes abusive in households and in nations. We know the cost of anger when it's turned inward, resulting in serious depression and withdrawal. And we know the zeal of the Lord for the Lord can fuel hate, one of the most troubling aspects of religious life in our world today. We don't want to seem like extremists of any faith, so we usually just turn and run away from any sense of God's anger at all, saying it's not for us. But I wonder, are we failing to live fully in our call as disciples if we avoid the anger of God? Because when we avoid the anger of God, we fail to see what's really askew in our world and what it is that makes God weep. We don't have a clear vision of what's wrong, and we deny ourselves the energy to make it right. We need to repent this Lenten season of our wrongly placed anger, our hateful anger, but we also need to seek God's anger that arises out of love for creation and love for humanity. We need to affirm God's longing for justice. We need to recognize that in God's anger, we can find energy, passion, and encouragement for addressing what needs to be fixed, desperately fixed in our world, where God calls for justice. When we read the Bible in all of its fullness, when we listen to the teachings of Jesus, we know where those places are. It's in the cry of the poor who are often brushed aside or blamed for even needing help. It's in the longings of people for peace, whether in war-torn lands, historical conflicts, or in homes where battery is too common of a happening. The cry for justice 
It arises from the depths of the earth, reminding us that balance is needed. If the earth is to sustain us, not only these days, but the days of our children and our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. God's anger at all those things who, all those things that would deny whatever it is that we humans do that gets in the way of the right relationship with God and one another. That's what it's about. God's anger is at those who deny love. And so it was with Jesus in the temple that day, with his zeal for the house of God, causing him to overturn tables, drive animals out of the temple. May we tap into that same zeal. May it energize us to wherever we are to challenge the forces of hate and to lift up the voice of love. Thanks be to God. Amen.